In many software job interviews, you will be asked to solve coding challenges based on algorithms and data structures. One type of algorithm that can be used to solve these challenges is the greedy algorithm. Greedy algorithms are used to solve optimization problems, and they select the best result at each iteration. In this course, Tanishk uses animations and diagrams to help you understand how to solve coding challenges using greedy algorithms. Let's say that you find yourself on a square, on a green square in a 2D plane. There's a voice that comes from above. Your objective is to maximize the gold because the gold you can get is the gold you keep. All right, all of this is pretty weird. Uh, why are you on a 2D green square and what is this voice? But now the voice continues and says that, hey, there are three rules that you need to keep in mind. And if you follow these rules, I let you keep the gold. All right, first rule, you can move in any direction, up, down, left, or right. Second, once a path is taken, there is no going back. Third, the game ends when no more steps can be taken. All right, so now you're pretty excited. You have the rules in hand and you have the objective of maximizing the amount of gold coins you can get. Of course, you're in a 2D plane, you should get as many gold coins as possible. So what you do is you go ahead and follow the first rule. I say that now I want to look in all the four directions. So we'll go ahead and look in all the four directions and we see this. We see that on the bottom square, if we reach and if we go to the bottom square, we'll get two gold coins. On the left, we have one and on the right, we have three. The top cell is a much more interesting cell saying that you will get one gold coin at this point of time. You will get one gold coin when you reach this square and this square happens to be a dead end marked by the bold lines. All right, so now you will ask the question, hey, well, since there is only one way I can go, you know, once a path is taken, there is no going back. Let me just go ahead and select three. You know, I want to maximize the amount of gold I can get. And it looks like, well, perhaps three might lead me to the answer. So what you'll do is you'll go ahead and select three and continue on and on your journey. And at the end, you get three plus one plus seven plus two plus five total gold coins. Hey, looks like a successful run. But is it actually the most optimal? Well, the voice is kind of disappointed right now. So that makes sense that maybe you have the optimal answer and you see the rest of the grid. And hey, we indeed found the optimal answer. We were able to maximize the gold for this particular grid. Now, obviously the voice is kind of disappointed and uh, it does not like this. So what it does is takes you and throws you in another grid. Now we'll do the same computation again. We'll go ahead and look in all the four directions and we see it's a similar kind of setup, mostly because the voice was lazy to change these four squares. But now you'll again realize that, hey, last time I selected greedily. I selected the biggest square that I got. I selected the biggest gold coin value giving cell and I just followed the path. So let me just go ahead and do that again. Let me just greedily pick the highest value and hey, maybe I get optimal answer once again. And so you go on and on and on, but hey, this time the voice was smarter. It only gave you zeros on this path. And now it pulls you back again and says, hey, you know what you missed? If you went to the square at two, if you went bottom, then you would have gotten two plus nine, which is much greater than three. This is an example of the case where thinking in a greedy approach will not work. And so you might ask the question, hey, it worked for the first one, but if it is not going to work optimally for all the possible cases, why do we even need to think about greedy solutions? Why do we need to worry about greedy solutions at all? Well, there are two big reasons why you should worry about it. First, it is asked in interviews. And second, it's a general algorithm that you should know because here's the thing, life gets complicated. And perhaps when you explore every single permutation and combination, you realize that, hey, this was too much effort. And there might be some problems where you can't even explore every single permutation and combination. And greedy in that case comes as a savior because using a greedy algorithm guarantees that you will get a solution. It might be the optimal one. It might not be the optimal one, but at least you'll have a solution. All right, so what we are going to do is over the next 10 videos that I've made, we are going to look at 10 different interview problems, all from interview bit, and we're going to slowly build up our intuitions 
on how to proceed with greedy algorithm problems. Hello everybody and welcome. Let's talk about the problem bulbs on interview bit. We're given n bulbs in total, which are either on or off, represented by 1 and 0 respectively. The condition mentioned in the question says that turning on the ith bulb causes all of the remaining bulbs on the right hand side of it to flip, which means that all of the bulbs on the right hand side which were 1 will become zeros and vice versa. The goal of this problem is to find the minimum number of switches to turn all of the bulbs on. The constraints mention that the n, the number of bulbs, can be between 1 and 10 to the power 5. And a of i can be 0 or 1, representing that the bulb or the bit we are looking at currently can either be 0 or 1. Alright, let's take a test case and try to work out a solution. In the case of 101, this is the test case we're going to start off with. We will also set the initial cost to 0. We'll say that uh, this cost is going to keep a track of the number of flips or the number of switches that we require to convert everything to ones. On the bottom right hand side is the logic we are going to use, which is already mentioned in the question. The question says that if the bulb is on, well, that's great. We'll just continue on. But if the bulb is zero, that is if the current bit we are looking at is zero, then well, we have to increase the cost by one and flip everything on the right hand side of it. All right. So let's try to simulate and see what happens. So this is the first element that we get. The first bit is one. So we'll continue on. Now, in this case, we get the bit as zero. What does this mean? This means that we have to increase the cost by one and we have to flip all of the bits on the right hand side of it, including the current one. So the zero becomes one and the one on the right hand side of it becomes a zero. Pretty simple, right? So now this is the area that we are currently working with. What about this third element now? Well, since this is a zero, we have to go to the else condition. The else condition says that the cost should be increased by one for converting this zero to a one. And then we'll flip all of the bits on the right hand side of it. Since there are none, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And we have the final array as one, one, one. At this point, we note the cost, which is equal to two, and we'll return this as the final answer. Now let's try to analyze the time and space complexity of the solution. The space complexity is order of one since we only ever store this cost variable on the top right. However, the time complexity is a bigger issue. It's order of n squared. See, because for every single bit, as we're iterating over the array, we'll take order of n time. And for every single bit, we might have to do another special operation of converting everything on the right hand side of it to be zero or one, basically flipping that around. So that's order of n time to iterate over the bits and order of n time again, if the bit is a zero. So that's order of n square time, worst case. Now, this was the naive solution and we were able to uh, write down the naive solution just by using what was given in the question. However, can we optimize this? The optimization of the solution depends on one single logic. There's just one thing that you need to know to optimize the solution. All right, let's take a bigger case and try to work out and simulate what is going to happen. In this case, we have 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. We see that the first bit is zero. So what do we do? Remember, we went in the else case. We encounter a certain cost in this case represented by the arrow. And because of this cost, we were able to convert this zero to a one and we have to flip everything on the right hand side of it. So the one becomes zero and the zeros become one. So we have one zero one double zero one double zero. Now, in this case, we encounter a zero again. Well, that's kind of a painful thing to do. As we already noted, the time complexity is out of n squared. Uh, so since we have this zero, let's go ahead and convert this zero to a one, encounter a cost of one and convert everything on the right hand side of it to be flipped. So the ones become zeros and the zeros become ones again. Now there's something going on. There's something very interesting in this slide. I want you to pause and ponder what's going on. There's one small little detail that you have to figure out. All right, if you place both of these side by side, you'll realize that both of these 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, have this yellow part of the string repeated. 
both of them have this yellow part of the array repeated. Now, what does that mean? Well, this means that if you do two flips represented by these two blue arrows that we showed, if you do two flips, everything on the right hand side of it becomes flipped by once and then gets flipped again. In essence, they get reverted back to their original states. Think about this, this makes sense mathematically as well. Say that we are looking at an array and we are looking at a random bit in the array somewhere in the middle. At this point, let's say that the cost is some cost variable that we have stored over here represented in red. Now we'll ask the question, hey, is the cost even or odd? Is the number of flips we have done even or odd? Because if we have done even number of flips, the bit remains as is. The bits get reverted back to its original states. So the B becomes B. It remains as is. However, if the cost is odd, we have to flip the bit. That's because it has been flipped an odd number of times. So one becomes zero and then becomes one and then perhaps becomes zero again. So if the cost is odd, we have to flip the bit. Now then what? Well, if we can figure out this part, well, we can just write down what we did before. If the current bit we are looking at is one now, we'll just continue. Else, we'll increase the cost by one. All right, let's try to code this up. So here's the code written and we are of course going to start off with the cost equals to zero and we'll return the cost at the end. Now we'll say for every single bit in the array, we'll iterate over all the bits in the array. We'll say if the cost modulo two is equal to zero, that is if this current bit has been flipped an even number of times, well, B equals to B. B remains as is. Else B equals to not B. That is if the bit was one, it becomes zero. And if it was zero, it becomes one. And now we can again ask the question as before, we can say that if this current flipped bit is equal to one, then what? Well, just continue as is. And in the else condition, we'll increase the cost by one. And once we're done with this iteration, we finally will have the cost. So you can realize that this takes order of n time complexity where n is the number of bulbs and it still takes order of one space since we are not storing anything other than the cost variable. All right, so this is it for the solution to the problem, bulbs on interview bit. Hello everybody and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem, highest product on interview bit. We are given an array of n integers and the goal of this problem is to find the highest product we can get by multiplying three elements. We can pick any three elements from the array. The constraints mention that n, the number of elements in the array, can be between three and five times 10 to the power of five. Let's take a couple of examples to understand this better. When the input given to us is one comma two comma three comma four, that is we have four elements in the array, the output we get is 24. And that's because we can multiply two times three times four and this is the highest possible product we can get, which is 24. Now, when the input is zero comma minus one comma 10 comma seven comma five, we multiply five, seven and 10 together to get 350, which is the highest possible value we can get. And so we return 350 as the answer. Now, what is one thing that is immediately very clear from these examples? The first thing we realize is that we can sort the array and we can pick the top three elements. In fact, we can write this down and we'll say that, you know what, one of the observations in solving this question is that we have to take the highest three elements, multiply them together and return them at the end. Now, whenever you have these kind of hypotheses, whenever you have these ideas, it is always a good idea to test them out. You have something in mind, you have a possible solution in mind, try your best to find a test case where this might not work. All right, we'll take a couple of more test cases and see how this is playing out. First, we'll actually test this if this actually works. So let's say that the case is minus five, minus two, one, zero, zero, three, four, five. In this case, the logic works perfectly because we take the highest three elements, three, four, five, multiply them together and get 60 as the answer. Right? So this makes sense. Our logic is sort of making sense for all of these three test cases. So we'll mark this as green and we'll take another test cases. 
as I mentioned, it is always a good idea to find test cases for which, for which this logic might not work. And in this case, is the test case minus 5, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 5. Again, the array is sorted just for the sake of convenience, which is something we'll also do in the code part. But if we multiply 1, 1 and 5 together, which are the highest three elements, we get the answer as 5. But this is incorrect. And this is because there's something else going on. Okay. Now, we, now that we have this array, what is actually the answer? Well, the answer is minus 5 times minus 2 times 5 giving us 50. And this is the second observation that we need to make. Recall how when you multiply two negative numbers, it becomes a positive number again, which means that we have two possible cases that we have to consider. First, we have to take the highest three elements. That's for sure. That's something we have established is correct for some test cases. And for the remaining test cases, we have to consider the case where there are two negative values and one positive value as shown in the second test case over here. Now this second test case gets 50 as the output, which is indeed the correct answer. All right. Uh, instead of saying two negative and one positive, since we're already sorting the array, we can say that, you know what? Consider the lowest two and the highest one. So either we take the first, uh, the highest three elements on the right hand side, or we take the lowest two on the left and the highest one on the right. All right. Now let's actually talk about the code for the solution. Here is the code. And uh, as I mentioned, the first step is to sort the array. So A equals to sorted of A, which will return me a sorted array. And this will be sorted in ascending order. So on the line seven, I have high three equals to A of minus one times minus two times minus three. Basically saying that we're going to pick the highest three elements. And then this is the second case that I mentioned. We will pick the two lowest elements, which is A of zero and A of one. And we multiply it with the high one. So which will multiply it with the highest element on the right hand side of the array. Now the answer can be any of those cases. And so we'll simply return the max of high three and low two, high one. And that is really it for the code of the solution. We can go ahead and submit this and this gets accepted. All right. So this is it for the solution to the problem. Highest product. Hello everybody and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem disjoint intervals. We're given a list of intervals, each represented by the start and the end times. And the goal of this problem is to find the length of the maximal set of mutually disjoint intervals. What does this mean? Let's take an example to understand this better. Let's say that the input given to us is 1, 2, 2, 10 and 4, 6. So there are three intervals given to us and we have to find a particular permutation and combination of all of them such that we can select the mutually disjoint intervals and we can create the maximal possible set of them. The answer in this case comes out to because we're going to select the intervals 1, 2 and 4, 6, leaving out 2, 10. This is the best possible case that we can have. Now, this might look a bit, bit cryptic, so let's go ahead and visualize this. So this is the visualization I've created. And uh, by the way, these do take a lot of time to create. So if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you like the effort I'm putting it, uh, let me know in the comment section down below. Anyways, let's go ahead and plot out the uh, intervals, which is 1, 2, 2, 10 and 4, 6. And now we're going to start off with some simulation. We're going to say, okay, you know what? Let's go ahead and select the interval 1, 2. So this is what happens when we select the interval 1, 2. And now we ask the question, hey, can we select the interval 2, 10 as well? And the answer is no in this case, because in 1, 2 and 2, 10, we can see that 2 is being repeated. So the point number 2 is going to create an intersection between these two intervals, which we do not want, right? So what we'll say instead is that, you know what? Let's go ahead and skip over 2, 10 and let's see what will happen if we include 4, 6 instead. So if you look at both of them, these are indeed mutually disjoint intervals and we can get the final answer as 2 for this particular test case. Now we did leave out 2, 10. So let's go ahead and see what will happen in a case when we try to include 2, 10. In the case we include 2, 10, we have 1, 2 and 4, 6 both left out. 
and that's because in 2 comma 10 1 comma 2 intersects in the 2 position and 4 comma 6 is basically embedded into 2 comma 10 so when we select 2 comma 10 we cannot select anything else right so the final answers for both of them are 2 and 1 so in this particular test case, we explored two different possibilities and we got the best possible answer as two. Now, this, what we've done here is uh, twofold. The first thing we've done by default is sort these index. We've sorted these intervals. Now, this sorting is something that we commonly do in these kind of interval questions. So that's one thing that you can keep in mind for later on as well. Now, the sorting thing is also very important for this question and we'll come back to it later. But now the second point is that we have, in a way, made some sort of decision, right? This question can be boiled down to a dynamic programming problem in a way, because we are going to make decisions of whether we want to include 1 comma 2 or not, whether we want to include 2 comma 10 or not, or whether we want to include 4 comma 6. Anytime we are making these sort of decisions and we want to look into the future, we want to look into the past and we want to figure out, okay, what's going on this current point of time. Whenever we want to make decisions, we're always going to go for dynamic programming. So dynamic programming is going to give you one correct solution is one particular approach that is going to give you a correct solution. But that might be a bit too complicated and maybe there's something else going on. And before jumping into any one approach, it's always a good idea to look at more test cases and see if there is another sneaky observation somewhere hidden. And so let's go ahead and try to find out what's going on. So I've written on another test case, which is one of the test cases mentioned in the question itself on interview bit. And the test case is 1 comma 4, 2 comma 3, 4 comma 6 and 8 comma 9. And I've plotted these out again because there are two possibilities that we'll consider. And just a quick aside, there can be test cases where there are multiple such possibilities, but I've only mentioned two of them for this test case just for the sake of convenience. All right, so let's go ahead and say that I want to select the interval. 1 comma 4. I make a decision to include the interval 1 comma 4. So the answer on the right hand side will become 1 in this case. Now can I select 2 comma 3? I cannot because it intersects. Can I select 4 comma 6? Again no because 1 comma 4 and 4 comma 6 intersect at 4. Can I select 8 comma 9? Yes I can. So let's go ahead and include that and increase the answer count by 1. Pretty good right? So as soon as we selected 1 comma 4, we sort of created a chain of events that led us to the answer 2. So 1 comma 4 in a way drove the solution and we got the answer as 2. Now what if I don't select 1 comma 4 and what if I select 2 comma 3 instead? So in the second possibility, we are going to first select 2 comma 3. Now can I include 1 comma 4? No, because it will intersect. Can I include 4 comma 6? Yes, I can because 2 comma 3 and 4 comma 6 do not have anything in common. They do not have any intersections. Now, can I go ahead and select 8 comma 9 as well? Yes, I can. And so in this way, by selecting 2 comma 3, we were able to get a better answer of 3. Now, if you also notice, as I mentioned, 1 comma 4, as soon as we select the interval 1 comma 4, in the first possibility, it sort of drives the rest of the decision making. And in the second case, in the second possibility, as soon as we select 2 comma 3, it drives the rest of the decision making. Now, what is the difference between 1 comma 4 and 2 comma 3? Maybe there's something inside of these both intervals that can lead us to the solution. So maybe this interval is, uh, maybe 2 comma 3 gave us a better answer because it starts later. You know, uh, 2 is greater than 1. So this interval is smaller, this interval from 2 to 3 starts from 2 instead of 1, so maybe starting later is a good idea. Maybe it's a good heuristic to get to a solution. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's the ending times that really matter, and because 2 comma 3 ends early, we can say that, you know what? All the intervals that are going to end early are going to give us a better answer. Now, at this point, we can't really be sure. I mean, we just got the hypotheses. Now, let's go ahead and test this out. We'll take the first example that we saw, the first very first example that we saw, which is 1 comma 2, 2 comma 10 and 4 comma 6. Now, which of them is going to hold in this case? Feel free to pause and see whether starting earlier, sorry, whether starting later or ending earlier is a better heuristic to get to an answer. 
if you notice 1 comma 2 starts earlier and 2 comma 10 starts later but we do not select 2 comma 10 we do not select the interval which is starting later we select the interval 1 comma 2 which is starting earlier which means that the point 1 is wrong but what about ending early we can see that both the intervals 1 comma 2 and 4 comma 6 are going to end earlier than the larger interval of 2 comma 10 so it looks like the first point starting later is wrong and the second point ending earlier is correct and feel free to pause here and ponder of like what this heuristic means this makes a lot of sense because ending early gives us possibilities in the future to work with if an interval ends early right now we can say that it leaves a lot more space a lot more time for other intervals to join in the party but if an interval ends later on if it end, if an interval drags on for a long time well then it will, might block other in intervals to join the party which means that ending early is a very good heuristic for this question in fact it is the optimal heuristic now we have already explained the intuitions but there's a formal proof behind why ending early is going to give you the optimal solution now if you're interested in the formal proof it's mentioned on my website links down below if you want to check it out but anyways we'll keep this ending early point in mind and we are going to go ahead and implement this logic so here's what i've done so the first thing we'll do is sort the intervals as i've already mentioned in the starting sorting the intervals is always a good idea and so we'll sort the intervals and the key in this case is the lambda function where we input x which is one particular interval and we're going to return x of one basically saying that sort these intervals by their ending positions because we want the intervals that end early to come forward first and we want the intervals which end later to go towards the end pretty simple so now what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and start with the interval a of zero we're going to interval which started and ended the earliest so a of zero is the interval we're going to start off with we'll increase the count and we'll set the count to one because we're already going to select a of zero and we'll also set the previous of s and the previous of e in mind which is the previous of start and the previous of end this will make sense in a second now what we'll do is we'll iterate over the elements inside of the array we'll iterate over the intervals giving us the start and the end times of each interval and now i'm going to ask one very important question i'm going to ask the question hey is the start of this current interval i'm looking at is before the ending of the previous interval let me say it again does the current interval start before the previous interval ends that is is there a overlapping is there an intersection between these two intervals because if there is an intersection if this condition is true then go ahead and pass do nothing in this case we don't want to mess with the cases where there are intersections we want to avoid them instead and in the else condition we're going to go ahead and write you know what go ahead and increase the count because clearly this current interval that we're looking at is not intersecting with the previous one so which means that we can include this current one right so we're going to go ahead and increase the count by one and we'll also say you know what go ahead and set the previous of f previous of s and the previous of e to be s comma a basically the previous intervals now become the current intervals times all right so this is it for the code of this solution now i know this is one of those questions where the greedy solution ends up giving you the optimal solution and the proof for that is mentioned in the written article on my website links down below in any case as i mentioned before uh, these visualizations do take a lot of time to create so if you enjoyed this video give it a thumbs up it lets me know that uh, you find these visualizations helpful and meaningful and if you want more of this kind of content well go ahead and hit the subscribe button i'll see you very very soon hello everybody and welcome back let's talk about the problem largest permutation we're given an array a of a random permutation of numbers from 1 to n that is we are given n total numbers ranging from 1 to n both inclusive and we are also given b which is the number of swaps in a that we can make so we can pick any two integers inside of the array a and we can make a swap between them and we can do this kind of swap b number of times the goal of this problem is to find the largest permutation possible 
Let's take an example to understand this better. Let's say that the input is a equals to 1, 3, 2 and b equals to 1. Now of 1, 3, 2, we can already see that, uh, you know, n equals to 3, which is there are three total elements ranging from 1 to 3, both inclusive. And b equals to 1, which means that we can make one swap inside of this array. We can pick any two integers once and make a swap between them. The biggest and the largest permutation possible in this case is 3, 1, 2. And that is because we can swap 1 and 3, giving us 3, 1, 2. Now, you can imagine 1, 3, 2 as 132 and 3, 1, 2 as 312. And so the output is the largest possible permutation we can get out. Feel free to write down more examples and try this out yourself. You won't be able to find any better permutation than 3, 1, 2 when b equals to 1. All right, now let's take a couple of more examples and try to build our intuitions and understanding from it. Let's say that the input array given to us is 1, 2, 3, 4. Pretty simple permutation, right? And b is given as 1, which means that we can make one swap in total. Now, let's actually write this array down once again. And now I'm going to ask you the question. What is the number that has the biggest bang for its buck? What is the number that can change the most? Is the number four, right? Four is the biggest number possible. And so if we can bring four to the front, that will be better than bringing three to the front or two to the front, right? So we'll, what we'll do is we'll swap four and one. And that's it. And that's the answer for this test case. Pretty simple, right? We're basically trying to find the numbers which have the biggest bang for their buck. All right, let's take another example and we'll try to work out a solution again. Let's say that the input is 3, 2, 4, 1, 5 and b equals to 3, which means that in this case, we can make total of three swaps. Now, how do we proceed to a solution? Well, what is the first thing that we should do? We want to maximize the number. We want to make the number as big as possible. So what we can do is uh, we look at 3, 2, 4, 1, 5 and we realize that 5 is the biggest number. 5 has the biggest bang for its buck, right? So we can take 1b, we can uh, take one step and we can bring 5 to the front. That does mean 3 goes at the end, but you know what? A number starting from 5 is going to be much greater than a number starting from 3. So we'll make that swap happen. Okay, what's the next step then? Well, since we have three Bs, we can uh, go for another row and try to look at this again. Now, which number has the most bang for its buck? Since we already made a swap with five, five is already in the best position possible. How about four? Now we can go to four and we can say that, you know what? Go ahead and swap four with the element in its position. So after five, we want to put four. And so this is exactly what we'll do. We'll swap out five, sorry, we'll swap out four with two. All right, so now we'll do this. And how about this? We have five, four, two, one, three. And now what's the next element that we can swap? This is the last swap that we can make. Which element do you think will give the most bang for its buck? Five and four are already in place. And now we only have the largest element three that is remaining, which is not in its place, right? So we'll go ahead and swap two and three. And this is a solution for this test case. Now, what is one thing that we observed right away? What is the one thing that we realized and we were solving these problems? What we realized was that we can greedily replace the higher elements. So we can say that, you know what, if five is not in its place, if five is not in the first position, let's go ahead and make that happen. Let's go ahead and put five in the first place. And then we'll ask the question, we'll ask the same question for four. We'll say, hey, is four in the right place? Is four in the second place in this test case? If four is not, well, go ahead and make that happen. Go ahead and make that swap. And similarly for three and then two and then one. Now, in case B equals 200, well, we will have reached a point where we have five, four, three, two, one. So that won't be very useful to us. Which means that, you know, the scary constraint given to us that B can be 10 to the power 9 is not really meaningful since the array is only 10 to the power 6 elements. In any case, this is the entire logic that we need to solve the problem. We can greedily replace the higher elements. So we'll make sure the highest element N is at the first position 
then the second highest element n minus 1 is at the second position and so on and so forth till we get to 1. Alright, let's talk about the code. The first thing we'll do is set up a couple of variables that we'll need for later. Now we set i equals to 0 since i is a pointer going from the start of the array to the end of the array. We need i because in the case of 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, I want you to look at the right hand side column. Note how 5, 4 and 3 are underlined. These are the elements that have been swapped with the other elements on the right hand side which are 3, 2 and 2 respectively. Now these elements are underlined because you can imagine that i is going from the start to the end and i is trying to fix every single number. So first we're going to fix 5 and then we're going to fix 4 and then 3 and then 2 and so on and so forth. So this max is going to keep a track of uh, of the current n, right? So this max starts from n and then goes to n minus 1 and then n minus 2 and so on and so forth as you can see here. Now we also have this d which basically tells us the positions of every single element. So dictionary is a dictionary from the value say from 5 to its current index. So in the case of 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, the value of the key 5 is 4. That's because it's sitting at the 4th index. Similarly, for the value 4, the index is 3. Sorry, the index is 2 and so on. Now we're going to say while these two conditions hold, while b exist, while we have any number of swaps left to be done and we still haven't iterated through the entire array, so while we're still iterating through the array and while we have swaps remaining to be made, we'll do some computation. We'll say that first of all, get me j. Now what is j? j is the d of max. Basically j is the location where the highest element is sitting. So in the case of 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, as I showed in the presentation, the in the first iteration, j is going to be what? j is the location of the maximum possible value. Now the maximum is uh, 5 in our case. So we're going to go ahead and ask the question, hey, where is 5? And the answer we get is 4. 5 is sitting at the index 4. Now we'll ask the question, hey, is the current index i the same as the return index j? That is, is 5 in its right position or not? Now if it's in right position, well, we don't really need to do anything. It's already in its right position and we can just continue on as is. However, if it's not in its right position, we'll have to do a swap. And so every time we do a swap, we'll have to reduce the b by 1. And what is the swap going to be? Swap is simply going to swap the i and the j elements. Right? As we saw, uh, when we realized that, you know what, 5 and 3 had to be swapped because 5 was towards the end and 5 should be in the start. Well, we wanted to replace 5 with 3 and so 3 will move to the position of 5. Now we'll say that uh, a of i comma a of j equals to a of j comma a of i. Basically 5 and 3 gets swapped. This is one more thing that we need to do which is absolutely essential which is to update their dictionary values as well. Since both of these numbers now are at different indices than they were at before, we'll update their dictionary values. Also, towards the end of this while loop, we'll also say i plus equals to 1. Basically, now we'll increase the i pointer by 1 and we'll reduce the max by 1. And that's because we started off with the, the maximum value as n, then we'll move on to n minus 1 and then so on and so forth. At the end, after we have made all of these swaps, we would have a, a that is remaining and this a is something we'll return at the end. All right, so this is it for the code. And that is it for the solution to the problem, largest permutation. Hello everybody and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem meeting rooms. We're given a list of intervals defined by their starting and their ending times. And each of these intervals basically represents a single meeting. And now we're given a list of meetings. The goal of this problem is to find the least number of meeting rooms required so that we can conduct all of the required meetings. The constraints mention that n, the number of meetings, can be between 1 and 10 to the power 5. The constraints also mention that every single time can be between 1 and 10 to the power 9. So let's take an example to understand this better. Let's say the input we get is 5, 10, 
15,20 and 0,30. What it means is we have three different meetings where the first meeting starts from 5 and ends at 10. So basically you can assume it starts at uh, time some t equals to 5 units and ends at t equals to 10 units. Then there's another meeting starting from 15, ending at 20 and a third meeting starting from 0, ending at 30. Now the output of this problem is 2, saying that there are at least two number of rooms required to conduct all of these meetings. And that is because we have to realize that 0 and 30, 0, 30 and 5, 10 are two meetings which intersect, right? They take place simultaneously, which means that we'll need to create two different rooms so that both of them can happen around the same time. Similar is the case for 0, 30 and 15, 20. Both of them again intersect, so we'll need at least two rooms so that the meetings can actually take place. All right, let's go ahead and uh, expand upon this example and try to work out how we actually got to a solution and simulate what is going to happen. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create these uh, meetings. So we have one meeting from five to 10. We have another meeting from 15 to 20 and a third meeting from zero to 30. Now what we can do is we can go ahead and start scanning from the left to the right. And so I'm going to create a pointer and this is the yellow pointer that we, uh, you're going to see. And this pointer is going from the start to the end, scanning the meetings. Basically, it is going to ask the question, hey, how many meetings are there currently going on? And so the current variable CURR will start from zero, basically saying that there are no meetings at time of zero. And as we iterate, as we scan through these uh, times, we'll go ahead and increase the current, which represents the number of meetings going on currently. And max is the second variable we need to keep a track of, which will tell us how many meetings rooms do we require. And the max is going to be the answer at the end. So the first thing we'll do is uh, we realize as soon as we hit time zero, we see that there is one meeting that is starting at this point of time. So we'll need to increase the current by one, right? So now we can go ahead and say that current equals to one. What is the maximum number of rooms that we require? Maximum is just the maximum possible value of current. So we'll put one in this place as well. Now, what do we do next? Well, the next thing we realize is that from time zero, including time one, two, three, four, we will only require one total meeting room. And so the current remains one. But as soon as we hit time equals to five, we'll need two meeting rooms because at this point of time, another meeting starts, right? The meeting from five to 10 starts at this point of time. So the current increases to two, which means that there are two meetings going on simultaneously. Now, what is the max going to be? Max is going to reflect the changes in the current and become two as well. All right. So now from the point of time five, six, seven, eight, nine, we will have two meetings running simultaneously, right? So the current remains two and the maximum remains two. But as soon as we hit time equals to 10, the current decreases back to one. And that's because one particular meeting, the meeting from five to 10 has ended right now, which means that the current number of meetings going on is one. That's the meeting from zero to 30, which is still going on. So we'll still need one room to take care of. Now what happens from time 10 to 11, 12, 13, 14, we'll only ever require one total meeting room. But as soon as time hits 15, we'll need another meeting room to accommodate both of these meetings simultaneously. The maximum stays the same and the current becomes two. So then what happens when we move to the time 20? Well, current again decreases to one since we only have one meeting going on right now. And then at time equals to 30, the current decreases to zero, basically saying that the meeting that was going on earlier from zero to 30 has ended. So the only thing that is remaining is the maximum, which is equal to two, which becomes the answer. Now, one thing that we have done across this solution is that we're going over every single timestamp. So we're going at time equals to zero. We're going at time equals to one and two and three and four and five, right? And we're going to look at every single timestamp. We're going to look at every single time and scan across all of these meetings to know which of them is going on. As you can imagine, that will take quite a lot of time. In fact, if we have cases like these, where we have one meeting from zero to 10 to the power nine, which is by the way, a valid constraint, whenever we have these kind of meetings, well, as you realize 10 to the power nine is not a feasible way to deal with this, right? If we iterate from zero all the way up till 10 to the power nine, we'll already get a time limit exceeded. And that's even just looking at one single meeting. What if we have multiple of these kind of meetings? That just means that this is not a good way to look at it. There's an optimization that's hidden somewhere. 
All right, so how do we think about the problem now? Well, let's go back to the nicer example and notice what you have done previously. The thing we realized previously was that we only care about the places where the change happens. So what it means is we are only going to focus on 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30. We don't care about what happens at time equals to 3 or time equals to 7 or time equals to 16 or 24 or 31 or 32. We only care about the times where changes happen. We only care about time 0, where our meeting starts. We only care about the time 5, when another meeting starts, or at time 10, a meeting ends. So we care only about the points of times where the number of meetings is going to change. So that's a central observation in solving this problem. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to write down these formally. So we're going to say at times 5, 15 and 0, we are going to require plus 1 meeting rooms. What it means is, as soon as we hit time equals to 5, we'll need one more meeting room. And if you look at the visualization, that makes a lot of sense. Right? So what you've done is we've figured out, we have picked out all of the starting indices, which are 5, 15 and 0, as you can see from the array on the top, and we have all assigned them plus 1 value. Similarly, we have assigned minus 1 value to 10, 20 and 30, because if you look at the array above again, 10, 20 and 30 are all the ending times. Basically saying that at time equals to 10, I require one less meeting room because at time equals to 10, one meeting has ended, right? So now what we can do is we can go ahead and write them in a better format and we're going to create a tuple of the time comma the change in the meeting rooms required. Now the next step we're going to do is pretty simple once you understand what's going on. The only thing we're going to do is we're going to sort all of these numbers by their times. So 0 comes first, then 5, 10, 15, 20 and 30. Remember, this is the way we discussed uh, in the initial example as well. This is how we are going to look at the problem. So what it means is, at time equals to zero, I'm going to require plus one meeting room. So we're going to have this current and the max variable as before. And at time equals to zero, I need plus one meeting rooms. So the current now increases by one, saying that I need one more meeting room than what I had previously. I had zero. So now zero plus one becomes one. What is the max going to be? Max is going to be the maximum value of current we have seen, so the maximum will become 1 as well. This is what happens at time equals to 0. Now what happens when we move to time equals to 5? At time equals to 5, another meeting starts. So we increase the current by 1. And the maximum reflects the change. Now what happens at time equals to 10? A meeting has ended. Now we don't know which meeting has ended, but one of the meetings has ended. That means the requirement for the number of rooms has decreased by 1. The current decreases from 2, as we saw here, the current decreases from 2 here to 1 here. Alright, makes sense? And similarly, so on and so forth, we can keep on going, we can keep a track of the current as how the meeting rooms increase or decrease and change. At the end of this iteration, you'll notice that the current becomes 0 again, because all of the meetings that started, all of them have ended right now. And maximum is again the answer to this problem. All right, so pretty simple what's going on, right? Let's go ahead and implement this. So this is the implementation with this question. The first thing we are going to do is create this uh, data array, this data list, which is going to store plus one. So for every single starting and ending element inside of this array, for every single meeting, I'm going to say, you know what, data.append, add the value s comma one to the data array. Basically saying that at this start point of time, I require plus one meeting rooms. The number of meeting rooms, the requirement of these meeting rooms increases by one. At the same time, I'm going to say whenever this particular meeting ends, go ahead and decrease the requirement of the meeting rooms. And so as I described earlier, the next step is going to be sorting all of these values so that we can iterate over them in a meaningful way. So the time is going to increase one by one. And we're going to increase the time and keep a track of the current as well as the answer. So I'm going to say for underscore comma v in data, basically saying, uh, I don't care about the time anymore. I only care about the change in the current. So I'm going to say for every single of these values, the current increases by that. So if v is plus one, the current increases by one. If v is minus one, the current decreases by one. Pretty simple. And the next step is then again, writing answer equals to the max of answer in the current. Basically saying that keep on storing the maximum possible value of current that you can get. And at the end, we can return this answer. So let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and test this out. 
and we are going to go ahead and submit this as well. All right, cool. So this gets accepted. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem distribute candy. There are n kids standing in a line, each of them having an integer rating associated with them. We have to distribute the candies following two rules. First, each kid gets at least one candy. And second, kids with the higher ratings than their neighbors get more candies. The goal of this problem is to find the minimum number of candies required to satisfy both of these rules. The constraints mention that n, the number of children, can be between 1 and 10 to the power 5. Let's take an example to understand this better. When the input given to us is 1, 3, 7, 1, the output is 7. And that's because the candies we can give them are 1, 2, 3 and 1 respectively. Let's go ahead and take a look at a visualization to help us understand what's going on better. So here what I've done is I've plotted out all the values. So the kid of the rating 1 is present at the first index, then the kid of the rating 3, then 7 and then 1 back again. Alright, so since the goal of this problem is to find the minimum number of candies possible and we have to assign at least one candy to each kid, let's go ahead and assign the kid with the value of 1, one single candy. Alright, so this is where we are going to start. with. And now what happens to the kid with the rating 3? Well, since the kid with the rating 3 has a higher rating than kid of the rating 1, we have to give it more candies. Now, how many more? Well, we can give it 3 candies or 5 or 10 or 100 or 1000. The goal of this problem is to minimize the number of candies we can give. So what we'll do instead is we'll just ensure that, you know what, this kid is going to get two candies, which is greater than one. All right, so this still satisfies the condition mentioned in the question. All right, so now we move on to the kid with the rating of seven. The kid with the rating of seven looks at the kid with the rating of three on the left hand side and on one on the right hand side and realizes that, wait a second, I'm greater than both of them. Now it looks at the kid with the rating 3 and says that, you know what, since I'm greater, since I have a higher rating than my neighbor, I should get one more candy than the neighbor. So we'll assign at the value 3. And now what about the kid with the rating 1 at the present at the very last? Well, we don't have to assign it uh, any more candies than the previous one because this current kid's rating is lesser than its neighbors. Which means that we can go ahead and simply assign it the default value saying that, you know what, since you are at a lower value, we're just going to give you one candy. To formalize the logic we have seen up till now, we'll write it this way. So we'll say that if the rating of the current kid is greater than that of the previous kid, then we are going to increase the score by one. And we are going to save that score corresponding to that kid. Otherwise, we'll set the score to one by default. All right, so let's go ahead and test this idea out on other test cases to see if it actually holds up or not. Or maybe it's just a product of this particular test case. All right, so let's take another example. This is the example we have. The kids are of a rating 1, 7, 4, 3, and 1. Now, as with previous case, we're going to assign this first kid the candy of 1 because that is the minimum number of candies we can give. What about the kid with the rating of 7? Well, it looks to the left of it and it realizes that, hey, uh, this kid has a candy of 1. And since I am, since my rating is greater than that of the previous one, I'm going to increase the score by 1. So the previous score was one, the current score becomes two, and we're going to save that. Now, when we move on to the kid with a rating of four, we'll ask the same question. Hey, is this kid having a higher rating or a lower rating than the previous one? So now we'll say that, you know what, since four is lesser than seven, this kid's rating is lower than the previous ones. We'll assign it the default value of one. And we follow the similar logic for the values for the kid of the rating three and one. All right, so this is the answer we have up till now following the logic we made. However, this is incorrect. And that's because if you realize the rightmost kid with the rating one gets one candy. And that's where it has the lowest rating. So we'll have to give it one candy. But the kid who is at the second last position with who has the rating three should get actually two candies. And that's because in the question, it's mentioned that we're looking at the neighbors which means that we're looking at both the right and the left neighbors together. Now, in this case, the kid with the rating three has a higher rating than that of the kid of the rating one on the right hand side, right? Which means that it should get a greater amount of candy. And so the answer changes, which means that we cannot simply iterate from the left to the right anymore. 
and we cannot get the answer this way because here's what the real answer is going to look like. Kid with the rating 3 is going to get two candies because of the kid of the rating 1 on the right hand side. Similarly, the kid with the rating 4 is not actually going to get one candy, but is going to look at the kid on the right hand side and say that, you know what, hey, this kid of rating 3 is getting two candies, so I should get more, right? So this kid will actually end up getting the answer 3. And similarly, we'll look at the kid of the rating 7 and now it goes ahead and looks at both its right and left neighbors. The left neighbor says 1 and the right neighbor says 3 and it realizes, hey, wait a second, I'm greater than both of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the maximum of them. I'm going to say that, you know what, this right kid is at a rating of 4 and it's already getting 3 candies. Which means that because I'm at rating 7, I'm, I'm higher than the kid of the rating 4, I should get more candies. So I'll go ahead and get 4 candies in total. Now, all of this was to demonstrate the fact that we cannot simply iterate from the left to the right. And as we saw in this case, the change is sort of uh, propagated from this one kid on the right hand side and the change is propagated from the right to the left. Make sense? This means that we cannot simply iterate from the left to the right and we can't do the same for the right to the left case either. Because if we just iterate from the right to the left, we will just have inverted the problem. Which means that iterating in either of these directions is not going to be helpful for us. We need a way out of the situation. We need a better way to assign candies to kids. How about this? How about we start from the lowest rating kids? So in this case, it's the kids of the rating 1. There are no other kids who have a rating lower than 1, which means that we can go ahead and assign values of 1 to both of these kids. That's because there is a constraint mentioned in the question that we have to assign at least 1 candies to even the lowest possible rating kids. So we'll go ahead and start with this default case, right? This is the default case. Keep this in mind. As soon as we find a default case, we're going to assign it one value. All right. So now we'll go ahead and ask the question for three now, right? We're starting from the lowest rating kids and we're trying to move up the ladder. So now we are going to look at the kid with the rating three and we are going to ask the same question. Look at the right and look at the right, right? And we'll say if the kid, if the current kid's rating is greater than the left kid's rating, then you have to give it one more candy. And if the current kid's rating is greater than the right kid's rating, well, you have to give it, uh, you have to give it one more candy than the right kid. Now, in the case of the kid of the rating three, what do we do? We look at the left, there is nothing. We look at the right, there is one candy. Now, this current value is going to be one plus one. So we'll say that the kid of the rating three is going to get a value of two. You'll understand this better as we walk through this more. So let's go ahead and ask the question, what happens to the kid of the rating 4, right? And the kid of the rating 4 looks at the kid on the left hand side, which is 7, it's greater, so we won't touch that. But on the right hand side is a kid with a lower rating, which means that 4 can demand one more candy from the kid of the rating 3, right? So it's going to look at 2 and be like, okay, give me 2 plus 1 candies now, please. So this is going to get 3 candies. And now we finally move on to the kid with the highest rating, right? We started from the lowest rating kids and we slowly moved up the ladder. And now we are going to look at the kid with the value of seven. And what is this kid going to do? This kid will look at the left kid, gives one candy. Is going to look at the right kid, has three candies. And now this kid will realize, hey, you know what? I'm greater than both of these guys. So let me go ahead and get myself four candies because that is going to satisfy both the conditions. All right, so now this should make a lot more sense. In fact, let's go ahead and take one more example, which is a slight bit more complicated example, but solving through this should get you to the solution. And if you're able to solve this yourself, then you have pretty much done the solution for this question. All right, feel free to pause the video at this point of time and try this out yourself. All right, cool. I assume you paused and solved. Now let's go ahead and start walking through this test case. So the first thing we'll do is start from the lowest rating kids. In this case, it's two kids on either side who have the rating one. So we'll go ahead and assign them one value each, right? We're going to go and give them one, one candy because that is the minimum possible candy we can give. Like these are bad kids. So we'll just give them one candy and tell them to be happy with it. Now we'll move up the ladder. We'll say, okay, what about the kid of the rating two? We look at the left, we look at the right. Now the left kid has a candy of one. This guy is higher than that. So it needs more candies. So we'll go ahead and give it the candy. 
Now we'll go ahead and look at the kids of the rating three. What do we do again? Well, look at the rightmost three value kid, right? This guy, this guy is going to look at the right kid, which is lower and the left kid, which is at equal value. Now, since it found a kid with the rating lower than that, that is the current kid's value is greater than the right kid's value. We are going to the second if condition and we'll say that the number of candies we are going to have to give through this kid is one plus the right kid's value. All right. So now we'll go ahead and give this the value of two. What about the second third kid, which is uh, present towards the middle? Well, we'll ask the same question. Hey, is this kid having a higher rating than the kid on its left hand side? No. Is this kid having a higher rating than the kid on the right hand side? Well, no, again, it is equal, but it's not greater, which means that we can go ahead and assign it the default value of one. We basically undercut this kid. Okay. <laughs> That's the raw explanation. Now, okay. What about the kid of the rating four? Okay. Look on its right. Look on its left. Left. There is nothing, but right. You can see that there is kid of rating one. So we are going to give it the value of two. And then for the value of seven, we're going to look at the left and look at the right. And what do we see? There's two either case. So just do two plus one, giving us three. All right. So this is it for the logic. It's pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to start from the lowest rating kids and we're going to gradually move up the food chain. We're going to gradually move up the ladder and look at from the worst kids to the best kids. And each time we'll go and look at the left and the right and assign it one more candy if needed. All right. So let's go ahead and start with the code. So N is the length of the array, the number of kids we have and data is what is going to be the very helpful part for us. So data is just a sorted array of X comma basically saying that, okay, for this particular kid rating, this is its index, right? That is all I've done. So what we are going to do is we are going to sort all of these kids by the ratings. But since we are sorting, we are going to mess with the array structure, right? We're going to mess with the indices. So we need a way to store the indices. And that is why we have this X comma I instead of just X. All right, cool. So now we are going to go ahead and assign one by default to every single kid. That's the initial uh, assumption in the question. We have to assign every single kid at least one values. All right. So we'll go ahead and assign everyone at least one candy. And now we're going to iterate over the data. We'll say that for every single X comma I, that is now X is not really important for us, but we'll say that for every single I, for every single index that you get, we'll go ahead and ask two questions. Hey, if I greater than zero, basically saying that if there is a kid on the left hand side of this particular kid, and this current kid's value is greater than the left kid's value. Well, if that is the case, then go ahead and do candies of I minus one plus one, right? If there is a kid to the left of you who is a valid kid, then go ahead and take its value and increase it by one. Only if the current reads, current kids rating is greater than the left ones. And we'll do the similar thing for the kid on the right hand side. And this is just a simple sanity check just to ensure that, you know, the element I plus one actually exists in the array or not pretty simple. And, uh, towards the end, what we can do is we can simply return the sum of all the candies, right? As you saw, the yellow elements are all the candies for every single person for every single kid. And so we'll just sum them all up together to get the final value. All right, let's go ahead and uh, test this out just to see if everything is working correctly and we'll go ahead and submit this. All right, cool. So this is it for the video solution to distribute candies on interview build. Hello everybody and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem C. There's a row of empty seats and filled seats represented by a dot and an X respectively. The goal of this problem is to find the minimum number of moves required to make the people sit together. The constraints mention that n, the total number of seats, including both empty and filled, are between one and 10 to the power six. So if we look on the right hand side, the input looks like dot, dot, x, dot, dot, x, dot. And the output of this question is two. Now let's go ahead and take a look at a visual explanation to understand this better. So we have people, two people sitting on the indices two and five, and the rest of the seats are empty. Now, what can we do to get to a solution? Well, the question asks us to group these people together. So what we can do is we can ask the person sitting at the index five to move to the index three. 
that we will have grouped together all of the people and we'll get a total cost of two. And why is that? That is because the person was sitting at the index five. So five minus three gives us two. Basically, we're looking at the absolute difference between these two seats. All right, so two is one possible answer and this is one possible configuration. If we go back to the original, now we can ask the question, hey, is there any other better thing that we can do? What if we ask the person sitting at the index two to move at the index four? Well, we'll get the same answer as two because two minus four in the absolute difference of two and four is still two. And of course, this condition is still satisfied that these people are grouped together at the end. So this is a pretty simple test case and there's not a lot of things going on. So what we'll do is to get a better insight into the problem, to get a better observation and analysis of the problem, let's go and take a look at a bigger test case. And I know this might look scary, but as we work through it, this will make a lot of sense. All right, so the goal of this problem is to group all of these people together. So how about this? How about I go ahead and assume that all of these people are going to be grouped together starting from the index zero. So here's what we'll do. We'll ask the person sitting at the index one to move to the index zero. This will get a cost of one. Then we'll ask the person sitting at the index four to move to the index one so that we can group them together. Then we'll ask the person at seven to move at two and eight to move at three. In this way, we have grouped together all of the people and we've gotten the answer as 14. However, there is no guarantee that this is in fact the optimal solution. So what can we do to find an optimal solution? If you notice, the goal of this problem was to group together the people. In other words, we're looking at a contiguous segment of people that start from a particular index. In this case, these group of contiguous people started from the index zero. Maybe that is not where we have to start. Maybe the best, most optimal solution starts from the index one instead. And so this is what can happen. Basically, we are going to recalculate the cost of moving every single person to their appropriate seats, right? So one moves to index one, four to two, seven to three, and eight to four. Makes sense. And we'll calculate the total cost. And now the minimum has decreased. The minimum has become 10. Pretty cool, right? And now we still don't know whether this is the optimal solution or not. So what we can do is we can go ahead and we can go ahead and test out the index two as well. Right? We are now going to start the contiguous segment from two. And so on and so forth. We can keep on doing, we can keep on increasing the starting position of the segment. And for every single starting position of the segment, we are going to calculate the time taken, the number of moves taken for every single person. We can sum them all up together and we'll be able to get to a solution. At the end of this iteration, as we have tested out every single index, whatever is the minimum, we'll return it as the answer. All right, so let's go ahead and implement this. I've implemented this in Python 3. And uh, by the way, just by the way, one of the things that you have to do for this question is uh, switch to Python 2.7 because there are some issues in Python 3. Uh, I am not sure what the exact issue is, but it looks to be an issue on the interview bit side. So we'll skip over that. Anyways, switch to Python 2.7 if you're using Python. All right. So first thing we'll do is set up a mod, which is one of the requirements of the question. Uh, and now what we'll do is we'll figure out the indices for every single cross. So we'll iterate over all of those, uh, all of those characters in a basically iterating over all the dots in the axis. And we'll ask the question, Hey, is the current character you're looking at is the current character next? Because if that is, well, go ahead and save its index. So by the end of this iteration, this crosses will have all the indices of X's and that's fine. All right. So this is the first step. Now what's the next step? Remember that when we were looking at the array, when we were looking at the case like this, we started off from index zero. So let's go ahead and force everyone to go to index zero. What we'll do is we'll go from I will go for I comma cross and enumerate of crosses. We'll do cross minus I. This is going to save the number of moves required. Assuming starting position starting position of the segment is zero, right? So feel free to pause here and understand what's going on. We're looking at the index of one cross and we are going to move it to another index I. 
which is going to be the appropriate index assuming that the starting position of the segment is zero. And now we're going to go ahead and find the number of crosses and we'll say simply say this is one edge case. We can simply say that you know what if n equals to zero if the number of crosses is zero well there are no people and the entire row is empty just return early and return zero saying that we don't require any amount of cost moving a person here from here to there because there are no person at all all right cool this is a simple test case now we'll go ahead and initialize the answer starting from infinity remember this is the minimum possible answer that we want to get so i'm going to initialize with the maximum possible value and now i'm going to start from all of the segment stars in range of length of a basically whenever i have this kind of uh, so in this case we have an array of length tenth i am going to assume that a starting segment can be from anywhere between 0 and 10 so this is what i've done i'm going to iterate over every single possible start of the segment for each of these segment stars i'm going to keep a track of the total cost for each segment which is going to start from 0 and now i'm going to say for cross and crosses basically for every single moves uh, re required. So this is the number of moves. Now crosses stores the number of moves. For every single one of these crosses, figure out the difference between this and the start of the segment. So this will give you the answer for the current configuration. And now we'll do total plus equals to this value and total mod equals to. So basically, uh, this is like one of the extra constraints in the question since the value can be very large. We have to return minimum value mod, uh, what is this? I think it's 10 to the power 8 plus 3. All right, anyways. So this is like an implementation level detail. That's why I did not mention in the problem setup that I had. Anyways, once we have this total, what we can do is simply assign answer as the minimum value of the answer and the total mod with the mod. All right, so as we go ahead and iterate through the segment starting points, and as we go ahead and iterate through every single one of these crosses, we will be able to get an answer. So let's go ahead and quickly test this out. All right, looks to be correct. And we can go ahead and submit this. So you can see that this says test case easy success, but this will fail for hard test cases. And that's because of this loops over here. You see, this loop takes order of n time to run. And that's because we are iterating for every single possible segment start. Now this takes order of n, where n is the number, n is the length of the array, which is the number of seats in the row. For every single one of those, I also have another order of an operation inside of it, where I'm saying for every single cross in crosses, do something. And now the number of crosses in a row can be order of n at maximum, right? If you have 10 people in the row, you can also have a worst case where all of these seats are filled. So this will just be a lot of pain to do. And this is order of n nested inside of another order of n, giving the total time complexity as order of n square. And you can see, that the test case hard failed because the time limit exceeded. All right, so how do we start to think about optimizing this problem? I mean, this is already a pretty complicated problem, but now we're asked to optimize this. All right, let's go ahead and take a fresh start. Let's say that this is the configuration we have. This is the test case we have. Now, if you look at it, can we not say that, okay, assume one, four, seven, and eight are people standing on these indices, right? So these are all of these people standing. Now let's say that the person one is uh, standing alone, four is standing alone, but seven and eight are having an interesting conversation, or maybe they are in a party and now they'll go ahead and invite person one and four to join the party. Now, where do you think both of these should land up? Like they want to all meet up together, right? That's the goal of the problem. We have to group together these people. So since seven and eight are already at their locations, they're going to go ahead and call four and one to come to their side, right? So this is one way we can think about it. The answer is hidden in clusters of people, right? So maybe if there is a very large cluster somewhere in the middle, then that might uh, attract all of these people and that might minimize the number of moves we take. So this is just a heuristic. And whenever we have heuristics like these, whenever you have ideas of how the solution might proceed, go ahead and do your best to disprove it. Instead of proving it, try to disprove it. And if you can find a test case where you can disprove it, well, you can go ahead and build your intuitions and observations more. So let's go ahead and take a look at another test case. This is a little bit more complicated, but it'll do the job. So now, uh, if you look at it, there are like three different total clusters of people. There are two clusters in the very beginning, two towards middle, 
and three towards the end, right? So what now? Well, since we said that maybe the biggest cluster is going to attract the most people. So let's assume that's the case. Let's assume 10, 11, 12 do not move, but they're going to invite everyone else. So four and five are going to move to eight and nine. This is going to take a cost of four and four respectively. Similarly, we are going to call zero and one to six and seven, right? So this will take a cost of six and six, giving us a total cost of 20. Now in this, this case, you can see that all of them are grouped together neatly towards the end of the array. And maybe, maybe that is the answer we are looking for, right? Maybe 20 is the answer we're looking for. But now if we use the brute force solution to verify it, we'll find that the test case that actually satisfies the condition is this one. The configuration which satisfies this condition is this one, where we have the starting segment index as two. And you can see that the score we get is two plus two for the first two guys, zero plus zero for the middle two guys, the middle two guys don't move. And the last three guys move and come towards this place. Now, what does this hint you at? It looks like everyone has come towards the middle of the array, right? It looks like everyone has come together with four and five. Although the biggest cluster was 10, 11, 12, these four and five guys somehow attracted everyone else. So maybe it's the point of middle, which is the more interesting observation we can get. You know, maybe we have to think about it from a middle point of view. But now the question is, uh, how do we exactly define a middle? At this point, I want you to pause and figure out what a measure of the middle could be. I know all of this has been pretty weird up till now, it's pretty new stuff, but feel free to pause at this point and try to figure out a solution. Because if you can do it, trust me, this is one of those kind of questions for which the solution you will never forget. You will never forget if you can figure this out on your own. All right, pause right now if you want to try this out. All right, so if you go back to school level mathematics, one of our chapters we are taught is statistics. And when it comes to statistics, there are three different, very common basic ways of getting to know our data set. There are three different measures that we use very commonly, mean, median, and mode. Now mode, as we already proved, is not going to give us a solution. We're not looking at the biggest cluster because 10, 11, 12 obviously move towards the middle. So mode is out of the picture. What about mean and median? Well, let's go ahead and assume that mean is going to give us the answer. So what we'll do is we'll take all of these indices of the people, sum them all up together and divide it correctly. So we'll have uh, a total of 43 divided by the seven people that are there. That are there. We have 43 as a total divided by seven people that are there. And so the mean comes out to six. Now what this means is the mean means that six is the middle point of the array, which means that since there are seven total people, there should be three people on the right of six and three people to the left of six. However, it looks like six is not the right answer. Five is, five is more middle than six somehow. So clearly mean is not the correct way to look at it. What about median instead? If you look at median, we get 0, 1, 4, 5, 10, 11, 12. And again, the middle element in this case is what? The middle element is 5. And 5 exactly matches with the perfect, the optimal solution. It perfectly matches with the optimal solution. And so it looks like we are looking at median as the perfect position for these segments. So median is going to define us the answer. So let's go ahead and write down that instead of going for that large order of n segment start loop, what we're going to do is we're going to do something very, very simple. We're going to say that the segment start is nothing but the median of the array. Now what, what array we are looking at? We're looking at the crosses array and we'll figure out the n by two element. We're looking at the middle element. We're looking at the median. All right, so that is all I've done. That is all the change I've made. Let's go ahead and test this out once and we'll go ahead and submit this. All right, so this works out. Anyways, I know this was a little bit complicated to figure out the median and the mean thing, but now that you know about the median thing, keep it in mind for future reference because there are many other questions, especially the tricky ones like these, which require both knowledge of mean and median. So keep mean and median in mind, test them both out in given a test case and see which one works out, which one does not. And that'll give you a better way to 
approach your problem and optimize the solution. Hello everybody and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem sign mice two holes. We're given n mice and n holes defined by these two arrays which contain position of each of the mice and each of the holes respectively. And a mice takes one minute to travel one unit left or right. The goal of this problem is to find the minimum time after which all mice are in holes. So basically the problem is we have to select a mice and assign it a hole so that it can travel from its position to the hole's position, taking the amount of time which is the difference between them, right? So I know this can sound a bit confusing, so let's go ahead and take an example to understand this better. So the first row tells us the positions of the mice and the second row tells us the positions of the holes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and plot this out just for the sake of uh, clarity. So there's a mice that exists at position three, another mice at position two, and one more mice at position, position minus four. Then we have three holes, one hole at zero, one at minus two, and one at four. Pretty simple, right? The problem setup is pretty simple. Now what's the greedy solution over here? What is something that you can do greedily? Well, what you can do is assign every single mice the corresponding hole. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the mice number minus four, it can simply go to the hole number minus two. And that's because both of them occur at the first position, right? When we sort these arrays, when we sort the mice array, when we sort the hole array, we can simply iterate over them one by one. So we can say that for the first mice, we're going to assign it to the first hole. So it looks something like this. And we'll take total of two time because it went from minus four to minus two. Similarly, now we're going to look at the second mice and assign it to the corresponding second hole. The mice moves from two to zero, taking again a time of two. And then we look at the third mice and assign it to the third hole. And so this mice will go from three to four. Now, if you realize what you've done, we have assigned the mice to their corresponding holes. Why is that correct? Why will that work? Can we prove that this will always work? And so to prove that this will always work, what we can do is we can prove that the mice will never cross each other, right? Because if they never cross each other, they will always go to their corresponding holes. Now, can we prove that the mice will never cross each other? Because if we are able to prove that, then we'll be able to prove that our greedy solution is in fact the optimal solution. So let's go ahead and take a simpler case where we just have two mice and two holes correspondingly. Now let's say that the, what we want to make these mice do is cross each other, right? Instead of going from left mice to the left hole and, and the right mice goes to the right hole, we are going to say the right mice is going to the left hole and the left mice is going to go to the right hole. But here's the catch. Here's the most important thing which makes the solution happen. Both of these mice are identical. I know these mice don't have any identity of their own, which means that we can look at their paths and we can make a split in the middle. What I mean is this. I can say that the left mice takes just a slight bit longer out and ends up at the left hole. And the right mice ends up taking a longer out to go to the right hole. And now what have we done? We are saying that if the mice cross each other, that is, if they have, if they are in a, this kind of configuration, then we can always say that we can split them out this way and these mice will end up taking longer times to get to their corresponding holes, which is a proof by contradiction because we will never take these longer routes. We will always take the shorter, most optimal corresponding route, which means that the sorting approach will indeed work and the greedy solution is in fact the optimal solution. So let's go ahead and code this up. The code is pretty simple. The first thing we're going to do is sort both of these arrays. So we'll sort all of the mices by their positions and sort all of the holes by their positions. We're also going to have an answer, which we start from zero. And now we're going to iterate for every single mice and every single hole in both of these arrays. So all this does is, is going to give us an iterable of the first mice and the first hole, then the second mice and the second hole, third mice and the third hole, and so on and so forth. So we'll be able to iterate over these mice and the holes effectively. And now I can simply say that the answer is the maximum of answer and the absolute difference between A and B. So which is the time mice takes, which is sitting at position A, to go to the hole at position B. And that is it. At the end, we can return the answer. So that is really it. We can go ahead and test this out and submit this as well. 
I was like, cool, this works out. So yeah, this is it for the solution to the problem. Assign mice to holes. Hello everybody and welcome back. Let's talk about the problem majority element. Now, most of the videos on YouTube will try to explain to you the boyer mural algorithm, which is from a class of voting algorithm. However, it is one of those which you need to know beforehand to truly understand it. Plus, if you're given this question in an interview, there is no way you can come up with that on your own. However, I'm going to present another solution. I'm going to present a solution which is super sneaky, something that you can come up with during an interview. And it's not even hard. It's pretty simple and it's right in front of our eyes. All right, without talking too much, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the problem setup says that we're given an array of integers of length n. And the majority element is defined as the element which occurs with greater than n by 2 frequency. The goal of this problem is to find the majority element. So if we look on the right hand side, we see that the input is 322, 422. Clearly the majority element is 2 because it occurs with the frequency of 4. And this frequency of 4 is greater than the required frequency of n by 2, which is 3. All right. So how can we get started with the solution to this problem? Well, let's talk about the naive solution. What is something that we can do right away? What we can do is create a frequency table. So we can say that 3 occurs with the frequency of 1, 2 occurs with the frequency of 4, and 4 occurs with the frequency of 1. Nothing special, right? We've just created frequencies corresponding to each element. And now what we can do is, after this step 1, we can take the step 2 as going over all of the keys in the dictionary and finding out their values. And if the value is greater than the required frequency of n by 2, well, we can return that as the answer. So in this case, as we iterate over the keys, we look at 3, then we look at 2, and we realize that 2 has a frequency of 4, which is greater than the required frequency of n by 2, 3. So since 2 has a greater frequency, we're going to return 2 as the answer. Pretty simple, right? Nothing too special. All right, so was the space-time complexity analysis? Well, order of n space is required for this solution because we're going to store a hash map or a dictionary, which can take order of n time to generate as well. All right, so we can go ahead and actually look at the code for this, which is pretty damn simple in Python. So from collections, we are going to import counter and counter not is nothing but is going to create us a hash map or a frequency table. And we're going to say counter of a, first of all, go ahead and create that counter and then use the most common function to get the most common one element. So basically get the highest frequency element and the rest is just uh, syntax related stuff. And this one liner solution will get you the correct answer. That is in fact, how I was able to solve this in less than one minute. But uh, the solution is not the most optimal because we're going to take order of n space. And the follow up question an interviewer can ask you is that how can you reduce the space? Is there a way to make the space order of one? Can you make the space constant? Which brings me to the sneaky solution. At this point, other people will go ahead and present to you the boyer Moore algorithm. However, there's a better solution that exists right in front of our eyes. All right, so let's go and take a look at the array again. This is the same array as we've seen before. And the constraint is now written in front of us that we have to do it in order of one space. If you think about it, we have to compress the entire hash map. We have to create, compress sort of the entire dictionary that we created, which took order of n space earlier. We have to compress all of that into somehow just order of one space. Sounds pretty weird, right? Impossible, in fact. Here's the thing. Whenever you're stuck in a dead end like this, I've explained this, by the way, in other solutions on my channel as well. Whenever you're stuck in these weird kind of situations where there seems to be no other way and the space constraint is order of one, you have to think in terms of bits. Go in the binary representations, okay? You don't look at the numbers now as numbers anymore, but they're binary representations. Here's what I mean. Instead of looking at three, I'm going to look at three as zero, one, one, which is nothing but the binary representation of three. Again, I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to write extra lines of code to convert this. This is just how it is stored in memory. So we're going to write three as zero, one, one, two as zero, one, zero, and four as one, double, zero. And I've written this for all of the numbers. Now, what I'm going to do is something very interesting. All right. Something super, super sneaky. I'm going to write answer over here and we're going to start iterating. Now, if you realize one thing, the majority element is the number which exists with more than n by 2 frequency. 
right? What it also means is that its binary representation will exist more than n by two times, right? Its binary representation itself will have a frequency of greater than n by two. What I can also say is every single one of its bits will also have a frequency of greater than n by two, which means that if we narrow down and if we just look at say this particular column, we see a lot of zeros. What does this mean? This means that the majority element has zeros in this place. And that's because this column is overwhelmingly filled with zeros. There is a majority of zero over here. And remember, we're looking for the majority element. All of its bits are in majority. So what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over all of these columns one by one and we'll build our answer. Here's what I mean. So we'll look at this column and we'll find out the majority element, which is either one or zero. Right, we're not worrying about uh, any frequency tables or hash map right now. I've just flipped the problem on its own head and now I'm asking, get me the frequency of one and get me the frequency of zero. That's it, just two variables, nothing else. So we can see that the frequency of zero is overwhelmingly more than the frequency of ones. In fact, it is greater than n by two. This means that the answer, the majority element has a zero in this particular column's position. All right, what about this particular column? That's right. We see that this column is overwhelmingly filled with ones, which means that the majority element has one in this place. So we're going to write one in this answer location. And then we'll iterate over to this column again. And what do we see? There are lots of zeros, not many ones. The number of zeros is greater than n by two. So we'll just keep zero over here. And that is it. So at the end of the iteration, we see that the answer is zero one zero. What is the integer representation of this binary number? That's right, it's two. We've found the majority element. And look at what we did, right? We just iterated over all of these columns once and say if the number is represented in 30 bits, we'll just go over this 30 times. So it's like 30 times n, which is the time complexity right now. All right, this will make sense a bit more uh, once we look at the code, but mostly this is the logic. What we are going to do is we're going to iterate over these columns one by one. And then for every single column, we're going to iterate over the numbers and find whether the bit is one or zero. And we'll count the number of ones, we'll count the number of zeros, and we'll be able to guess whether the answer will have one or zero in this place. All right, let's go ahead and look at the code. So we're going to start off with a couple of variables. N is the length of the A, which is something we're going to require very soon. Then we have the answer, which is set as zero. And this is the answer which we are going to return at the end, right? So as you remember, we start the answer from zero. All right, so now what we're going to do is we are going to iterate over the columns one by one. So we'll say for B in range of 32, that is for every single bit from zero, one, two, three, all the way up till 32, go ahead and iterate over these columns. For each of these columns, I want you to keep a track of the number of ones in a column because the number of zeros is simply N minus the number of ones, right? So we can just keep a track of the number of ones to get to a solution. And now we'll say, you know what, go ahead and iterate over all the numbers in A. This is an order of n time uh, operation. We'll go ahead and write order of n over here. Now we'll say that, you know what, if two to the power of B, this is nothing but uh, two to the power of B. If two to the power of B and num is true, that is this entire line means what? This lines mean that the current bit B is set in nums. If the current bit B is set in num, then we can increase the number of ones by one. And we'll say that, you know what, at the end of this iteration, if you find that the number of ones is greater than n by two, that is there are overwhelmingly a number of ones inside of this column, well, go ahead and make this column a one as well. So go ahead and set this bit one inside of the answer. We can also write this as this uh, or operation, or we can write it as plus. It's the same either way. Anyways, once we're done with all of those columns, we would have built our answer one by one and we'll have the answer returned at the end. So we'll go ahead and test this and some of this. Meanwhile, let's talk about the complexity analysis. The space taken is order of one, since we only ever store a couple of variables and the time complexity is order of n times log w. Now, I know this log W seems a bit off since we're just doing, uh, you know, 32 total uh, iterations over for the columns. 
but we have to put this log of w because this 32 is not guaranteed right there can be numbers which are huge which are not stored in 30 or 32 bits they may take 50 bits or 100 bits or 1000 bits whatever that is so we'll just say log of w as the log of the word size so in this case integers had a size of like 10 to the power 9 which is approximately 2 to the power 30 so we took 30 times n iterations right so it's order of n times log w again i know this is not the most optimal the time complexity can be order of n and space complexity can be order of one with the boyer moore algorithm however this is an algorithm that you can come up with even during an interview and the thing we realized and the central observation that helped us solve this problem was that whenever the space constraint is so high whenever the space constraint is very very hard and we are working with these integers and there seems to be no other way out we have to think in terms of bits that is the central us uh, the central observation in getting a solution for this problem this will not only help you for this problem but other problems as well so keep this idea in mind for later all right anyways this is it for solution to the problem majority element hello everybody and welcome back let's talk about the problem gas station all right here's the problem setup we're given n gas stations in total which lie along a circular route each of them has A of I amount of gas present. And to travel from station I to station I plus one, there is some cost associated with it, which is given by the B of I. So one quick thing to note is that A of I and B of I are two elements from the arrays A and B, both of the size N. All right. The goal of this problem is to find the earliest station in terms of the indices from where we can travel around the entire circuit. So basically, you start from a particular index i, which is the lowest possible index. And that index is such that you can start from i and you can make a journey and go back to i. Right. And we have to return minus one if it's not possible. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example. Assume this is an example given in the question itself. And the answer to this example is the index four. All right. So index four is an index from where you can go ahead and do an entire circular route and come back at index four. Let's try to verify this and we'll work around with the problem setup so that we understand what's going on better. All right, so when we're at the station four, when we start at the station four, we have gas seven and cost one. What does that mean? That means that at station four, we start from an empty tank and we go ahead and fill in seven units of gas, All right? And now cost one says that to travel from station four to station zero, remember this is a circular route, to travel from station four to station zero, is going to take one unit of cost, right? So it's going to take one amount of gas from it, which means that the current amount of gas we have still remaining is going to be six. So we have, we are starting from the station four and once we reach the station zero, we still have six units of gas remaining. So when we reach the station zero, what we'll do is we'll fill up the tank with three units of gas again. So that brings up to nine units. And then we have to spend four more units of gas again to travel to the next station. So we had six plus three minus four total amount of gas now, which gives us five, right? So at station zero, we have five units of gas in our tank. All right. What happens when we go to station one, we'll do five plus five minus two. Five is the current amount of tank we have. Five is the amount of gas we get on the next station. And we have to subtract two as the cost. So five plus five minus two gives us eight. Similarly, what happens when we go to the station number two? We do eight plus two minus one giving us nine. And then what about station three? We do nine plus one minus nine giving us one. What next? Well, now we can go back to the station four. This is the station we started off from and we went ahead and we did a complete circular loop and we reached back at the same station. Station four is the lowest possible station that we could have started from that resulted in a circular route. So four is the final answer for this test case. Now, how do we think about the solution? Well, the brute force solution says that for every single index, you know, iterate over the array, go for every single index, and for every single index, run a simulation, right? So that simulation is going to take order of n time as we just saw, and we have to do this for every single index. That means that we are looking at a total of order of n square amount of time, and perhaps order of one space, because we don't really store anything than a current variable. Right, so we need to think about an optimization. Now, before we jump into the optimization, which by the way is going to be super simple, I have to mention one trick which I learned before. 
This trick has helped me out a lot in questions where there is like a circular route or whenever we have to go in a circular direction. And that trick is to simply take this array and copy paste it. Alright, so what I've done is I've copied the array, the first part of the array, first half of the array right now is the initial thing and the second half is just a copy paste of it. Alright, and I've also mentioned the original indices on the top of them. So the index 5 is actually the index 0. Now, how does this help us? Well, think about it this way. Because we're going on, on a circular route, if we start from the index 0, we want to end at the index 0 again. But because circular things are a bit more complicated to take care of, what we've simply done is we have expanded that out. And so now we are going to say, when you start from index 0, go ahead and figure out if you can end at index 5 instead. If you start from index 1, see if you can end at index 6, because index 6 is nothing but and index 1. Similarly, if you go to index 4, we just want to ensure that you end at index 9 because 9 acts as 4. So all I've done is simply taken the initial array, doubled it. So in a way, we have avoided the circular thingy problem. This makes the solution a lot simpler because the only thing we have left to do now is to iterate over that. And that is it. All right, let me walk you through the solution. It'll make a lot more sense. So let's go ahead and say that uh, 0 is the starting index. 0 is the station I'm going to assume, which is going to lead me to the station number 5. All right, I'm going to assume that. So let's go ahead and mark this. This is our starting index. Now, this is our starting index. We start off with the empty gas tank. What do we do? We fill in 3 units of gas and the cost is, well, the cost is 4, which means that the current is uh, minus 1. Well, that is not so good. We have 3 units of gas with us and to go to the next station, we require 4 which means that we don't have enough gas to go to the next station. Here's an if condition for you. We'll ask the question, hey, is the current lesser than zero? Because as soon as the current becomes lesser than zero, let's go ahead and make a full reset. Let's go ahead and say that, you know what? This station will not work out for us. This question, this station is, uh, is going to give us a negative value. We, we don't want that. So we are going to say that if the station is going to give you a negative value, just set the current to zero. Let's just go ahead and restart everything from scratch. And so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and initialize and I'm going to reset the start to I plus one. So we simply move on to the index one as the starting position, as you can see by the yellow circle moving. Now at the index one, now at the station one, we again ask the same questions. We start off with an empty gas tank. The current is zero, as you can see from the if condition previously. We start off with an empty gas tank. And now we fill five units of gas. Go to the next station, we require two, so the remaining is three. Pretty simple. So now we have three units of gas remaining. That is, we have three extra units of gas, and now we can go to the next station with three more units of gas than we had previously. So three plus two now becomes uh, five, which means that once I reach the next station, I'm going to fill in two units of gas, which brings me up to five units. Then I'm going to spend one unit of gas, so it brings me down to a total of four units of gas. All right, pretty simple, still greater than zero, which means that I can, uh, I still have four units of gas surplus. I have these extra four units of gas just lying around just in case. So now I'm going to go ahead and go to the index three. So as soon as I go to index three, I see that uh, I have four units of gas. I fill it with one, bringing me to a total of five. Now I have five units of gas and the cost to go to the next station is nine which means that the current comes out to minus four because five minus nine is minus four, which means that this will not work out either. We assume that the starting index of one will work out for us, but it did not work out for us. So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and reset the start to I plus one, right? We're going to reset everything. We're going to say, you know what? Screw the index one, screw the index zero. Both of them that did not work out. Let's just go ahead and restart all of our computations from the index four. So we'll restart the current to zero and set the start to I plus one. So we start off from four. Now at this point, I want you to pause the video and uh, figure out something missing, figure out something that is going wrong. All of my explanation up till now has been correct, but there's one assumption that is wrong. Well, at least that should look wrong to you. That's the assumption over here. Look at this. Earlier, we considered the index zero, then we considered the index one as the starting position, and we jumped to index four directly. We never even considered two and three. So now the question is, well, why don't we want to consider the indexes two and three? 
What's wrong with them? Why not consider both of them? Right? And so this is where the optimization comes into play. This is the most important part, right? We, we don't want to go back. Otherwise it'll just become like, we're going to start from every single index and that'll become n square and that's pain. But because we have this logic of starting from uh, start equals to i plus one, we were able to jump a couple of indices. Now, again, this begs the question, Hey, why not consider two and three? Here's the thing. Here's the very, very important things is my new detail, which matters a lot. Look at the if condition on the left hand side. The if condition says that if current is less than zero, then go ahead and make a restart. In other words, I can say that car only passes a station when the current is greater than equals to zero. What this also means is that as it passes through more and more stations, it keeps on collecting more and more fuel. That is in a one particular station, it is going to collect at least zero amounts of fuel, if not more. So it might be some positive amount of fuel is going to accumulate every single station it passes through. And if it does not pass through, well, it goes to the if condition and gets resetted. So now we know that car only passes when current greater than equals to zero and it's going to accumulate more and more fuel, which means that starting from one did not give me an answer, right? Starting from one gave us a negative value of four. But if you start from two, you'll get even a much more worse value. In fact, go ahead and try this out yourself. If you start off from two, you'll get gas two, cost one, giving you a current of one, which is already lesser than the current of four. And now you have one of current, you add it with the gas of one and remove cost nine, basically now giving you minus seven. So if you start off from two, you are going to end up much worse. You're going to end up with a current value of negative seven, although it does not mean anything different, but it's just extra computation. Starting from one was the best possible option because it was the earliest we could have started. And we could have collected a lot more fuel if we started off from one instead of two. But hey, even one did not work out. So how in the world will two work out? All right, I think that's enough explanation for why we do start equals to i plus one. And uh, so let's go ahead and do the computation. We start from the index four. We start from the station four now, and we have gas seven cost one. What does that mean? We do plus seven minus one, giving us six. Now we'll go on to the next index with the uh, capacity of, well, of course the tank capacity is infinite, but now we have the current as six and we're going to add it to the gas and remove the cost from it. So we'll do six plus three minus four. Notice one more thing that we're doing. Remember that we copy pasted the array ones, right? If you can see the indices five, six, seven, eight are nothing but a copy of one, zero, one, two, three, four. And of course you can compare the gas and the cost values as well. Now, all the reason why we did that was so that we could simply iterate over it and get our life, get our job done, make life easy. And it is going to make our life easy because now we're simply going to continue with the same logic. We're still going to keep that if condition in mind and we're going to continue forward. All right. So now we are at the index five, we are at the station five, which is nothing but the station zero. And currently we have five units of gas. What happens when you go to the next one? We do five plus five minus two, giving us eight. Then we do eight plus two minus one, giving us nine. Then we do nine plus one minus nine, giving us one. And finally we'll do one plus seven. Oh, wait, as soon as we go to the next station, I want you to realize something. Look at that. We have reached the station number four and look at the station that was marked earlier. The number station four was marked earlier, which means that we have gone through an entire loop. Again, the station number looks like it's nine, but it's actually four behind the scenes, right? So now we are again at the index four. We are again at the station four. What does that mean? What does that mean? Was the initial question was the question was find the initial index, which will find the earliest index such that you can go in and loop around once. And so we have found that index. And so what we can do is we can say if i equals to equals to start plus n, n is the length of the array, which is five in this case. So if nine equals to equals to four plus five, go ahead and return four. Perfect, right? As you can recall, the earlier answer was four as well. And the current answer we're going to return is also four. Pretty amazing, right? We did nothing special, just two if statements. I promise you that is literally it. This, these two conditions and a looping over all these values. That is it. Nothing complicated, no special proofs or mathematic or arithmetic you need to worry about. All right, let's go ahead and code this up now. 
So what we'll do is figure out n, the, which is the length of A, basically saying that these are the number of gas stations with us. We're going to start the current and the starting both from zero. As I mentioned, we're going to assume the start as zero. This is our starting position. Assuming that this start will give us the answer at the end. We also have current, which is going to keep a track of the current value of the gas tank. Now we are going to iterate for i and g comma c in uh, a star to b star to. Okay, uh, just a quick aside. What this means is simply that I'm going to take this array a and I'm going to copy paste it once again. So a is nothing but twice of a. It's just a plus a, right? It's the same as a plus a. All right. Sorry. And then we do uh, b plus b or b times two. Same thing. We'll zip both of them. A is nothing but the gas and B is nothing but the cost. And now we're going to enumerate over that. So as I mentioned, the first shift condition is saying that, you know what, if the current index I is equal to equals to start plus N, basically you've seen this station before. This station is a loop of the previous start that you've seen. If that is the case, look at the condition over here. If that is the case, I've just copy pasted it, return start. Again, simple, very, very simple. Okay, nothing special we're doing. It's just simple stuff. All right. And then we'll go to this statement, which says current plus equals to G minus E. So what it says is whatever the previous current was, now you add it with a certain amount of value of gas, right? I'm going to say, uh, this is current plus G minus E. All right. Very simple. I'm going to take the previous value in my gas, uh, in my gas tank, add some additional gas G and remove some cost of moving to the next station. And then we'll move on to this if condition over here, as I already so mentioned, again, simple copy paste. If current is less than zero, that is if we have not enough gas to move to the next station, well, that means that we have to reset the current. So the current becomes zero and we have to set the start as I plus one. Basically we'll say everything, including I and everything before I and including I is all useless for us. Let's just reset the start to I plus one. All right. So if you notice, we are returning the start over here. Now, if you can find an answer, you'll be able to return it over here. But in case you do not find any such answer, in case there is no such possible case where you can take an index and loop around the circuit once and reach back the same index, well, then you unfortunately have to return minus one saying that, you know what? I reached the end of this for loop, which means that there is no way there's any such possible index. All right, enough speaking, let me go ahead and actually show you and test this out. All right, cool, this works out and we'll go ahead and submit this. And there we go, our answer is correct. All right, so this is it for the solution to the problem gas station. These visualizations take me a lot of time to make and uh, if you appreciate them, if you appreciate the high quality of my visuals, explanations and the solution, let me know in the comment section down below and give this video a thumbs up. Anyways, this is it for this video solution. And as always, thank you so much for watching.